भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येक्षजत्रा स्थिरंगुष्टुवाग सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदा स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्वेदा स्वस्ति नस्ताक्ष्यो अरिष्टनेमी स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शांति 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 we are doing the mandukya karika we are on the second chapter last time we did this verse let's start with chanting that verse again verse number 31 second chapter 31 swapna maye yatha drishte swapna maye yatha drishte gandharva nagaram yatha gandharva nagaram yatha तथा विश्व दृष्ट तथा विश्व दृष्ट वेदु विचक्षण वेदु विचक्षण सो दिस वर्ड सेज गिव्स थ्री एग्जाम्पल्स फॉर वॉट इज द स्टेटस ऑफ दिस वर्ल्ड गिव्स थ्री एग्जाम्पल्स जस्ट लाइक द वॉट वी सी इन अ ड्रीम एग्जाम्पल वन that's of course the classic example which um gaudapada has been using throughout chapter 2 dream so this world is compared to a dream remember by that what he means is as the dream is false with compared to your waking similarly the waking world is like a dream only because it is false compared to turiya to pure consciousness just as the dream world seems real within the dream so also the waking world seems real within the waking world so it's not with respect to the waker that the waker's world is false just as with respect to the dreamer the dream world is not false the dream the dream world is as real as the by dreamer by dreamer i mean you in your dreams you are a person in your dreams with respect to that person the world that person is experiencing is pretty real it's only false compared to to you the waker when you wake up and you look back upon your dreams you say oh it was a dream similarly from the point of view of turiya pure consciousness our real nature this waking world is equally false that's what he means by dream it's like a dream maya by maya here uh, i'll come to you here by maya he means magic show magic show not uh, you know brahman maya and all of that here means just like a magic show so it appears to be true what a magician is showing but we know the magician alone is the truth not the the illusion the magician creates and gandharva nagar gandharva nagar means uh, um, a city in the clouds city in the sky we say castles in the sky when you fly you see clouds in different forms like houses and people and animals none of which are there they look like that but they are not true in themselves in the same way vishwam idam drishtam and the, whatever is experienced in the world the status is exactly like that with respect to the ultimate reality not here not r- r- right here this is pretty real and it continues to be so but the ultimate reality which is the consciousness in which waking dreaming and deep sleep is experienced compared to that this world which we experience in the waking reality is no more than a dream no more than um a city in the clouds or no more than a magic show how do we know this vedanteshu vichakshanehi this is known from from a vedantic vision it's a vedantic vision it's not um um something that is arrived at through common sense or um something that is a product of scientific investigation when you analyze through vedant the way we did in the first chapter the analysis of the three states the atman has four aspects waker dreamer deep sleeper and consciousness the real consciousness which appears as waker dreamer deep sleeper that analysis 
When you go through that, then the world is revealed to be of this nature. You had a question. Uh, yeah, so it's basically, is enlightenment is it the equivalent of waking up in a dream where you have a lucid dream, you wake up in the dream, you're fully aware you are dreaming. Good. In the dream, right. you can manipulate it. Um, sometimes you can, sometimes you cannot. Even when you know that you are in a dream, you really are, often you cannot change the plot. The, whether you can change the plot or not, that's not a sign of whether you are woken up. What is the sign of waking up in a dream? Is that you realize a dream to be the dream. Yeah, that's yes. What yeah. Um, in the same way, you are right, waking up here it's would be a bit like a lucid dream. Not completely waking up from a dream when the dream itself disappears. That part is not true. Because enlightened people, even after they wake up, they still experience this world and they live amongst us. They don't disappear from this world. Realize that this is, yeah, there is a deeper reality, which is my own reality and the reality of everybody else, compared to which this world is also a dream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's quite a, quite a lot like that, yes. In fact, one place where the dream example fails is, after you wake up from a dream, in you, know, you get up, you sit up in bed, the dream is gone. You are not seeing the dream world anymore. But in enlightenment, it's not that this world will disappear for the enlightened person. Uh, it will still keep on appearing. But you realize... You have the awareness of the realization. Yes. So, examples have limitations. The so dream example has this limitation. Um, a film, when you are watching a film, you realize it's a film. It's not really that there is uh, King Kong is a giant... Uh, uh, a gorilla who is coming to get you. No, it's just a movie. And after realizing that it's just a movie, the movie still continues. The movie doesn't switch off just because you've realized it's a movie. That would be awful. You wouldn't be able, able to enjoy any movie at all. So, yes, you realize it's a movie and the movie continues as it is and you really cannot change the plot of the movie also. It, it, it continues as it is. You only realize that it's a film. It's, it's like a dream. It's like a magic show. Uh, it's like a castle in the sky. You had a question? So, do you, is that you change your uh, true state and you get the realization? Yes. Or you real, first you change the true state? Drishti is point of view or perspective. Please come, sit. Drishti is the point of view or perspective, if that's what you mean. Correct. In fact, what Vedanta tries to give you is a change of drishti, a change of perspective. When you have the Vedantic drishti, this, this pers perspective, you've got it. That is realization. When it becomes real to you, not just uh, intellectually changing. Yes. Come, 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 settle down. Yes. And follow up question. Yes. So just to compare it to the lucid dream, when you become enlightened and because you can, in a lucid dream, you can create with your mind. Mm. Same here, you can also create with your mind. So once you wake up, mm. don't you have even more the ability or the realization that you can create? With maybe, your mind and maybe, maybe, and maybe not. Because if you see the lives of enlightened people, anybody would consider enlightened throughout history, uh, not just in a non dual tradition, but in all traditions. They uh, did suddenly reality alter because they become enlightened and they changed it by magic, the whole world became fantastic. No. When they did change the world, they changed it in the way everybody else was, through work and through sacrifice and through love and like that. So that's why I'm resisting that idea that you can manipulate it just by thinking about it. Uh, you probably cannot. Um, and you would not want to either. Why is it... Yes. And it's, it takes a little more time here because of the density, mm. but it's a similar concept. So I'm not saying manipulating, but you can create. I understand what you're saying. It's something like what they talked about. Uh, what is that book? Um, the the secret or the mi mir the secret? Yes. What you think about manifest, what yes. manifest it. Yes. What you think about intensely that will come to be. So that. To the extent that is true for us, it's also true for the enlightened person, maybe a little more true for them, because they are much more powerful that way. But, again, 
Remember, nowhere in Advaita they talk about that. The, the reason being, why would you want to do that? The very fact that you would want to do it is an enormous obstacle to becoming enlightened. It's because we invest this with some reality. That's why would, we would want it to be this way rather than that way. The moment you want it to be this way rather than that way, yeah, then you are thinking that this is real. So enlightened persons, do they change the reality? They do it. Of course they do it, much more effectively than we can. But if you look, the best way to understand this is look at the lives of the saints. How do they do it? They do it by leading their very holy lives. And they also use it to heal. Yes. Yes, certainly. Certainly. But enlightenment is not about that. Even before becoming enlightened, one can still do that. People have occult powers. Right? So people can do that. But enlightenment is not a means to getting those occult powers. In fact, every master has said that uh, occult powers are an enormous obstacle to enlightenment. This desire to become more powerful as an individual uh, is, uh, is a very worldly desire. Um, truly powerful is waking up. What gives you mastery in the film? Becoming another character in the film or realizing that it's a film? Realizing that it's a film. Yes. To keep it in English, can you ask me in English? It is called that uh, in psychology, it is called wish-fulfillment. Wish yes, wish-fulfillment. Wish then for the, those who are the enlightened people, their wish also is fulfilled in the dream? Um, wish is fulfilled in the dream. Yeah. Freud is telling that. Nothing I don't see where these issues come up at all. The point here is that dreams appear in your awareness. The waking world also appears in your awareness. You are that awareness. This realization sets you free from samsara. Whether I wanted to have a cookie and I got it in my dreams. Yeah, that could be alright. But what does it have to do with this? Hmm? Remember one thing before I go ahead. Because what's coming here next is a hammer blow. It, it, uh, it's... Uh, Vedanta is the final teaching of the Vedas. This most ancient of religions, the final teaching, they came to the highest wisdom they came to, we are talking about it. And Gaurapada is somebody who states it without pulling any punches. And he's going to do that now. To appreciate that, we must realize that we are taking great shortcuts. Gaurapada, Vedanta insists that when you come to Vedanta, one must have intense dispassion. That is, if you are full of worldly ambitions, worldly desire, not seeking the truth, not seeking enlightenment, I seek worldliness. I seek to be rich and beautiful and powerful um, in this world. Or if it's not possible, I seek to be like that in some other world in heaven. Then that is for you. Don't come here. That's what Vedanta says. If you are seeking enlightenment, freedom from suffering, you want to know what is the truth of this universe, about, about myself, and final freedom, liberation, salvation, moksha, nirvana, then this is for you. Otherwise, what's going to come next will be very shocking. It's the end of every worldly ambition whatsoever. So unless one is a little free of all those things, we, we, are not, we are not perfect saints yet, but unless at least mentally we are ready to be. I'm ready to be a Buddha. I'm ready to be a, a Jivan Mukta, enlightened person. Then only the next verse will be a message of hope inspiring. Otherwise it will send us into deep depression. What's going to come next? So with, it's with that caveat that I'm going to go ahead. You have a question? Well, I do. Um, a, a movie is written... When you go see a movie, you know there's an author. Yes. This world doesn't seem like there's an author. As a matter of fact, it seems like it's a mess. But it must have an author because it keeps going. Hmm. So uh, the composer, who is the author? 
true. Um, religion would say Ishwar or God is the author. If you want to see why is there a particular pattern or a scheme to it, then the whole idea of causality or karma is introduced. Yeah. Mm. But again, remember, we are going beyond God and karma in, in this, this, this teaching. Uh, this is uh, finishing school for religion and spirituality. Uh, God, remember those 35 theories about the universe which we went through in the class, the last class and the class before that, that included God and karma. And he dismissed all of that by saying all of them are imagined or projected in the self, in consciousness. If even God exists, God exists in your awareness, right? If God appeared to you, God appeared to you, which is first, God or your awareness? Your awareness. The universe appears messy or orderly. To whom? To your awareness, which is first, a messy universe or you? Don't look confused. Look at your own experience. To you the universe is appearing, right? Right? So who's first in your experience? You have to say, I am first. The universe appears and disappears in my experience. The universe seems orderly and nice in my experience. The universe seems disorderly and messy in my experience. And Gauravada is interested in you, that, that experiencer. Mm -hmm. He says that is fundamental. Neither the universe, nor karma, nor science, nor religion, nor even God. Among the 35 theories which God apart, if, if you remember, one after another, he said, he said all of these theories are there as an explanation for this universe. But remember, they all depend upon you, the awareness. So what is more fundamental? Um, now we are coming to the 32nd verse, which is really important. Um, it is the most important verse in this chapter because it summarizes the teachings of this chapter. And it's also one of the most radical statements of non-duality found in the entire literature of non-duality. So we'll read it and I will explain. We'll go about it two, um, in two steps. First, I will explain it in general. If you want a detailed explanation, I've given a talk about this verse only. It's called the ultimate truth. You'll see it, it's on, on YouTube, you'll see the ultimate truth. The whole talk is on this verse. I will, what I will say will be that, that talk, but in a, a much more um, summarized form. Um, yeah. So it will be in, in a much more... Yeah. It will be in a much more summarized form. If anybody else has got uh, phones, <laughs> please, please silence these infernal devices. Um, so I'll just in two stages. One is, I will explain the verse. Um, then the second one will be, we will do it a little more serious way. We will go into Shankaracharya's commentary. He's written a beautiful commentary on the verse. So we will do a close reading of that. I will read out the original Sanskrit and translate and explain what Shankaracharya says about this verse. Very interesting points he raises. So let's do it this way. Now we are going into the 32nd verse. Na nirodho na chotpatti Na nirodho na chotpatti Na baddho na cha sadhaka Na baddho na cha sadhaka Na mu mukshur na vai mukshur Namo mokshur na vai mukta Itye sha paramarthata Itye sha paramarthata What does Gaudapada say? This universe, this world. And remember when he says this world, for him it means whatever you experience in your waking state, whatever you experience in your dream state, and whatever is the blankness in the deep sleep state, the all together is the world. This universe, gross, subtle, causal, stula, sukshma, karana, this entire universe, of this universe, this universe has never been created, will never be destroyed. Na nirodha, no cessation. Na utpatti, no origination. So this is actually 
Gaurapada's famous one theory is associated with him, Ajatavada, the non-origination uh, theory of, of the universe. All throughout, before this, what was going on? How did this universe come to be? 35 theories were taken up one by one, including, if you remember, starts with prana, prana meaning their, their Ishwara, God. So 35 theories were taken up. And Gaurapada dismissed all of them. Then what is your explanation? How does this universe, how did it originate? Gaurapada gives a stunning answer. It did not originate. How will this universe come to an end? It will never come to an end. Not because it is eternal. It has always been there and it will uh, never come to, uh, always be there. Not in that sense. In the sense that it never was there and it never will be there. So, this universe has no origination, no cessation. And within this universe, what about us? Now, we are more interested in ourselves. So, what about us? I am in bondage. He says, nobody is ever in bondage. Nobody ever is a spiritual practitioner. Nobody ever is a spiritual seeker. And nobody ever gets spiritual f freedom, moksha. What is this? He says, this is the ultimate truth. Ittyesha paramarthata. No, no cessation, literally if I translate, no cessation, no origination, nobody in bondage, nobody who is a spiritual practitioner, nobody who is a spiritual seeker, nobody who is liberated. This is the final truth. Alright, so what does, he, what does he want to say? Besides wanting to shock us. To understand this verse, one must understand it in context. One sentence keep in mind. This entire thing what Gaudapada said is from the Turiya point of view. From, let's say, from the absolute point of view, from Brahman point of view. From that point of view, what does the world look like? Like this. Alright. Now, why is this so stunning? What is, what is happening here? What Gaudapada is doing is, he is uprooting the standard idea of Vedanta which we have been taught. What have we been taught so far? What have we learnt in Vedanta? In general, in the larger context, in all of religion, but specifically in Vedanta, what have we learnt so far? We have learnt, here is a universe, a real universe out there. Some say God created it. The materialists will say it was created by Big Bang. Um, that... Um, uh, um, Vedanta seems to say it is Brahman projected through Maya and this world is created by Maya and then in that we are we are actually Brahman but we don't know that we are, we are jivas right now individual beings we are in bondage bondage means every religion puts it in different ways Christianity will say we are under the yoke of the original sin and we are fated to suffer until we are liberated. Or we are under ignorance or we are under the bondage of karma, our past karma. Um, or Vedanta tells us that we are in ignorance. We do not know our real nature. That's why we are jivas. We are suffering. Uh, we are in... Uh, the Buddhism says that we are all under suffering because we are subject to desire and we must overcome this to get freedom from suffering. So one Vedanta and all other religions that teach us we must become spiritual seekers, mumukshu, seeker after spiritual freedom. That's the goal of human life. And Swami Vivekananda says the goal of life is to manifest the divinity within. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna says the goal of life is to realize God. So we must become a spiritual seeker. And becoming a spiritual seeker is not enough. One must do something about it. What do you do about it? You become a sadhaka, a spiritual practitioner. Um, meditate and pray and um, um, do rituals and, and serve humanity. And, and so many things you have to do as spiritual practices. Sadhaka, sadhana you have to do. And then what will happen? One day, hopefully, we will become mukta, saved, enlightened. We will get nirvana, moksha where you are free from bondage. So this is the story, the plot. And Gaudapada says, none of it is true. Now, one must understand this 
in a mature way. In an immature way, what happens is it leads straight, leads straight to either depression or atheism. That's why Bandukya Karika was regarded as the highest teaching and not given openly. It was it's the most powerful of the Upanishads. And it was not taught openly and it was considered too advanced for most people. Because the negative effect could be whatever little faith somebody has in religion, that might be ruined. That's an, that's an immature way of approaching it. But people have become like that. There have been people um, who take it in that spirit. So we must understand it in the proper context. And what is the proper context? What is the mature way? The mature way, if you approach it, then what will happen is, we will really understand for the first time, in a much deeper sense, what is meant by this universe. We will understand what is really bondage, what is the real nature of bondage. We will understand what is spiritual seeking and what is spiritual practice. And we will understand what it means to be free. So all of these things which Gaudapada is, is denying, is negating, we will understand the real nature. All of them will point to our real self. Uh, the, the highest truth as much as it can be said. So that's what we are to, we're going, to, we're going to try to do. So we'll try to understand this. What is Gaudapada saying? Remember also, if you look at traditional Advaita Vedanta as Shankaracharya taught it, as most of the other Advaita texts, in contrast to Gaudapada's Karika, it will seem as if Gaudapada is uh, very radical. And some scholars say, Gaudapada said something else and Shankaracharya taught something else. I have told you this earlier. I asked a monk in the Himalayas, now, do you think there is a difference between the teaching of Gaudapada and Shankara? It's, a, it's a, uh, an interesting topic in Vedanta, in, non -dual, in Advaita Vedanta. I asked, why, is there, why, does there, uh, why does there seem to be a difference between the two? Because there, there seems to be a difference between the two. Um, he said, um, Gaudapada, uh, 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 Shankaracharya was a Jagat Guru. Thay. Shankaracharya was a world teacher. By world teacher means somebody who has to carry everybody along. He has to teach something which will be useful for everybody. Not just a core group, a small group of people. So Shankaracharya, he teaches everything. Um, the path of knowledge and that too in baby steps. And also devotion, everything else is there. So everything is there in Shankaracharya's teachings and in his commentaries on the Upanishads. And then I asked, but what about Gaudapada then? If Shankaracharya was a world teacher, what was Gaudapada? And his answer was, Gaudapada uh, Acharya to bahut phakkar mahatma the. He, the only way to translate this is, phakkar means somebody, literally it means um, like you have a hobo here or a tramp uh, or a homeless person. In the Himalayas, it means a, a very desperate kind of monk, you know, who doesn't care for anything at all. Who will tell you the way it is, as he has understood it, he will tell you directly as it is. Without caring for much for your welfare as it is, <laughs> what's going to happen to you when you hear that. So, Pakkar means not care, don't care kind of person. In the high Himalayas, that's what it means. In the lower plains, it means um, like a no good beggar or a tramp or... <laughs> Something like that. So this accounts for the difference in their approach. Shankaracharya is much more considerate. But it does not mean that they are teaching two different things. As we shall see, it's basically Advaita Vedanta, which Gaudapada is stating. stating. But he is stating it without any um, gift wrapping. Yes. Yeah. Any kind of, without softening the blows. All right. So let's quickly look at the verse and what it means. And then we will go into Shankara's commentary on the verse. What, is, what does it mean? No origination, no cessation of the universe. I'll use a couple of examples to illustrate. The classic example of, um, of a clay pot. So when a potter shapes clay into a pot, has he made something new? Has a pot originated? From a Vedantic perspective, no. Because when the pot is made, please examine the pot, take it in your hand and look at it. Where is the pot apart from the substance clay? The material clay, what you are holding is clay. The weight is the weight of the clay. Yeah. The form is given on clay. 
the whole pot if you look at it as reality as substance is nothing but clay when you investigate the pot it's clay on the outside clay on the inside the top bottom everything is clay is it still is a pot the question Advaita asks is, is the pot a second thing apart from clay? Dvaita. Is there something else there? When you say there, we literally mean, is it there at all? Is there a second thing there? Show me the pot apart from the clay. Let me take the clay away. Show me the pot. You keep the pot, I'll keep the clay. No. That's not possible. And yet it seems to us, this is crucial. It seems to us there is a thing called a pot. So what, and Vedanta explains, why does it seem like that? Because there is certainly something which has the form pot, which has the, it looks like this. It has a name, pot. Apart from the clay, a new name is given, pot. And it has a new use. You can put water in it, milk in it. So, Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara, name and form and usage, these are new. And Vedanta does not deny them. Vedanta puts all of them under Maya. <laughs> Why, what right do you have to dismiss name and form? Name is also a reality, form is also a reality. Use, it's a real use. Why will you dismiss it? Tell me why. Lack of permanence, certainly. Not only that, this name and form and use... Any of it is possible without the clay? No. no. They are not intrinsic to the clay and they are not possible without the clay also. They depend on the clay. If you take the clay away, what, where will the name pot stand? It will hang in the air. Where will the form of the pot be there if you take the clay away? Will it be a shadowy clay in the air? No. A shadowy pot in the air? No. Will there little be a little outline? Is there somebody else who has come? You can come in. You can come in and sit. Where will they... You can come here. Yeah. Where will the use be there? You, you keep water in the pot. Suppose I take the clay away. Can you still keep water in the non-existent pot? No. So name and form and use all depend on the substance. In the same way, in this universe, Brahman alone, look at it from the point of isness. Everywhere Brahman is available as the substance, I'm using word substance in a loose sense, as the substance of this universe, as isness, as being. In Sanskrit, Sat. Everywhere you find, is, uh, chair is, man is, woman is, sky is, earth is. Uh, that isness, we ignore it. We don't think, we, we think it's just a word. It's not just a word. It is the reality. Vedanta calls it Sat. Being, uh, the very existence of things. That is the reality and the rest, man, woman, sky, earth, all of these are name and form and transaction, usage. Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara. This name and form and usage are considered to be Maya and it's a completely dependent reality upon the underlying isness. Just as no new thing called pot was created. No new thing called universe is created in this isness. How will you prove it? Apart from the isness, is there a universe? Logically, no. It's tautological. If you, for example, the chair is. If the isness being is taken away from the chair, what will happen to the chair? Chair is not. It applies to the entirety of the universe. Gross things like stars and galaxies and protons and neutrons, they exist. If, if existence itself is taken away from them, they'll disappear. They have nothing apart from that isness. But they have a name and form and behavior. Interactions are different. They're, um, all of science and religion and politics, everything is possible in this world. Transactionally, it is all there. But their underlying being is one. And that one isness is what Vedanta speaks about. Other than that, no new thing called universe is produced. Yes. So, does God the Father acknowledge the existence of the universe? No. He acknowledges existence of Brahman. Okay. That's what he's pointing out. He acknowledges the appearance of the universe. He acknowledges the experience of the universe. 
but he does not acknowledge a thing called the universe is produced. Mm. Yes. Can we say then that pure consciousness is like the clay? Yes. Yeah. Only that clay is an object. Here the pure consciousness is not object. It's equivalent. Like it's equivalent, yeah. Um, you can call it, here I'm instead of using pure consciousness, I'm using pure being, sat. It's the same thing. In uh, Vedanta, being and consciousness are one and the same thing. Um, you might ask, just as an aside, a little logical exercise. Why do you say being and consciousness? Being means existence. Why do you say existence and consciousness are the same thing in Vedanta? Because imagine there were two different things. If consciousness is there is apart from existence, what kind of consciousness will it be? If I say consciousness is, I take the is away, then what will hap- happen to consciousness? Non-existent, non-existent consciousness, not unconscious, non-existent, non-existent consciousness. So consciousness cannot be apart from being. It must be an existing consciousness. The other way around seems to be more complicated because we have an intuition. There are things which are other than my consciousness. So being can exist apart from consciousness. But apply Gaudapada's logic. If existence, follow this is subtle. If being or existence is apart from consciousness, it becomes an object to consciousness. And being an object, remember, objectivity, uh, being an object is the sign of falsity. It becomes an appearance in consciousness. If con- existence is there without consciousness, then it's an object existence. So it becomes an appearance in consciousness. It will not be real. It will become dependent on consciousness. Then, All right. It's just a, an aside. From, let me give you another example and then we'll move ahead. This classic snake rope example. The snake, the um, snake is imagined on the rope. It is a mistake. People see it in the semi-darkness and think that, though there is a snake there. But tell me, was the snake produced? Was there actually a snake which came out of an egg and wriggled and came on top of a rope? No. It was a mistake. Shankaracharya asks, was a snake ever born in the rope? Did it originate in a rope? No. And was it ever killed? Was it ever um, the body of the snake was buried or something? No. Now, when you when you realize it's a, it's a it's a rope, does the snake actually die and it has to be disposed of? No. There is no origination of the snake. There is no cessation of that snake also. There is only the appearance by error of the snake. Shankaracharya says the snake is born neither in the rope. Is there a real snake being born in the rope? Is there a real snake being born in the rope? No. Is there? A, you'll say, no, 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 the snake is in the mind. But let me ask you, is there a real snake in the mind? That's even more impossible. What is there is, is an experience of a snake. An imagination, a projection, an error. But not a real snake wriggling about in the mind. Is it ever born by a conjunction of the two? A part, a joint effort of the rope and the mind? No. The error is there because of a joint <laughs> effort of rope and mind but real snake is never born uh, either in the rope or in the mind or in both so there is no origination of a snake and hence there is no real cessation of a snake what happened there was a mistake that the rope is a snake and the mistake was corrected so in the same way it's not that a universe originated in Brahman and then somehow it was removed again no Brahman alone exists or that pure consciousness alone exists, it's misunderstood as this. This. I'm having an extraordinary uh, optical illusion here. From my point of view, I can see the Holy Mother in that other building. Yes. Can you see? Yeah. Yeah. The picture? Yeah. The picture of the Holy Mother? Yeah. Straight? Can you see from here? Yeah. If you, co- you, you can't see from there, maybe. Yeah. You, you have to come here and see. I can see straight. Uh, on the wall of that building. Now this is very symbolic. Holy Mother is Mahamaya herself. (laughs) She projects herself out there as the universe. 
Now, this is what you're seeing. You're very blessed to see this. This is the moment of enlightenment. <laughs> she is there, but she appears out there. So in the same way, you alone, the pure consciousness, you seem projected out there as a universe, like your dream, for example. So this universe, which is projected out there, did it begin? No. The, can it have an end? No. <coughs> Beginningless, endless. Beginninglessly not there. Endlessly not there. <laughs> the wrong understanding is when, when you say it has no beginning and no end, no origination, no cessation, you think oh, it's an eternal universe he's talking about. Just the opposite. Uh, it's beginninglessly not there and endlessly not there. But beginninglessly and endlessly appearing like that. This is knowledge. Okay. Let's go further ahead. Just one point here. I mentioned it earlier. This whole thing, if you reduce it to a, scientific, uh, to a philosophical analysis, the question of the relationship between consciousness and its objects. How do you experience life? You experience life as a sentient being, as consciousness and experiencing things people, your own body, your own thoughts, and a world out there. So basically, if I reduce it to two terms, consciousness and its objects, what's the relationship between the two? I have mentioned this earlier. Four approaches I have mentioned broadly. It's good to put it here. We'll see what are the four approaches and see what Gaudapada is saying. Four approaches. Consciousness, I'm calling it C. What consciousness? You the consciousness. Just now, you are the conscious being. And whatever else you experience, <laughs> object. Huh? Object means what? Starting with your thoughts. What's the first thing that comes in front of consciousness? Your mind. Thoughts, ideas, feelings. Next thing, body with its sensory apparatus. Next thing, external world. People and events and things happening. All of them are objects to consciousness. Now the question is, neither cessation nor origination. What is the relationship between consciousness and uh, objects? So, one, there are four options I'll mention. Four great theories. One is, consciousness originates from the object. The world of time, space, matter, energy... Over, and it's created in the Big Bang and over time organized itself into galaxies and stars and planets. And on this planet, uh, matter further evolved into living matter and living matter further evolved into complex living matter with nervous systems and brains. And in those nervous systems and brains, somehow consciousness originated. This is the materialistic idea. Science, materialism. So materialism. Object is real and consciousness is a product of that object. Are you with me? Are you agree this is what science says? What materialism says? Yes. More or less. The opposite theory is held by religion. Consciousness produced object. I'm using ph uh, philosophical language. This is called theism. What do I mean by that? Let me tell you. All the theistic religions, those religions which believe in God, there are religions which do not believe in God. So, for example, Buddhism, Jainism is another one. So, Sankhya uh, in Hinduism. But those religions which believe in God, they believe in a creator God. God created the universe. Common to um, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Uh, in, our, in Hinduism, you have got Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Shaktaism. God is the creator of the universe. Basically, in our language, consciousness is the creator of the object. Consciousness is the creator of the object. By a universe, what, what, is, what do you mean by universe? Object. Time, space, matter, energy. And this God who is the creator of the universe, if you ask these religions, conscious God or unconscious God? And they'll all say, of course, conscious God, not an unconscious God. So consciousness is creator of the universe or object. A third theory is, Consciousness and object are parallel. Neither creates the other. This is the Sankhya idea. 
nature, time, space, matter, energy, prakriti is eternal, independently existing and consciousness is also eternal and independently existing. This is pretty close to what right now in the 21st century is being promoted as panpsychism. David Chalmers and if you google it you will find. So he doesn't know it is 5000 years ago Kapila <laughs> said this exactly the same thing. So this is one, one theory. And a lot of things are happening now. Just last week I saw, you might have seen in the news it was there, scientists in UCSB, um, University of California, Santa Barbara, two scientists have proposed that uh, consciousness could be uh, ubiquitous. It, it, it's just universe has a dual nature, a material nature and a conscious nature. So everything in the universe in, in some sense is conscious. Uh, and he, he relates it to some kind of vibration and synchronicities in vibration, something like that. Uh, not that I agree, but it is something like this, that there are these two realities in this universe. And they don't, this does not come from that and that does not come from this. They are independent, they interact. Gaudapada says none of these. What does he say? Consciousness alone is real and object appears in consciousness. This is Advaita. So the object also is nothing other than consciousness. It is not created from consciousness and it certainly does not create consciousness. They are not independent realities. Rather the only independent reality is consciousness in which objects are, they appear and are experienced. And a simple uh, argument to support this is, that's our experience. What is your experience of the object? What is your experience of the objective universe? Where do you find it? In your awareness. In your awareness, isn't it true? You understand what I'm saying? All your life, whatever you have experienced, you have necessarily experienced it in your awareness. Your faith, belief, disbelief, science, religion, art, family, love, hate, school, college, family, life, um, retirement, all of that has been experienced in awareness. Literally a statement of this thing. All right. So, this is what, this is what Gaudapada says. So, the objective universe, somebody has got a phone which is vibrating. Something right here. I can hear it. How come you can't hear it? It's done. It's gone. Mm -hmm. All right. So, this objective universe is neither originated nor does it cease. It appears. All right. This much. Now, what about us? We are interested in our own lives. So, I am in bondage and Gaudapada says, No, but duh, you are not in bondage. Yeah, yeah, I know. After I get liberation, after I get moksha. No, no, no. Right now, you are not in bondage. You never were. In fact, after enlightenment, you know what? We will realize this, that we were never in bondage. It's, we will not realize that we were in bondage. Now I am a Buddha and I am enlightened. No. That's what the story tells us. That's what Gaurapada is pointing out. That it's just a story. The fact is, even right now we are not in bondage. Take a common sense approach. What is it that you are, you are in bondage to? Are you in, bound to the body? No. The body undergoes its changes irrespective of what you want. It was born, it was a baby, it was a teenager, it was a young person, a middle-aged person, a senior person's body. And one day it will go, no matter how much we hold on to it. I, the conscious being, you can manage it. Yoga, gluten-free and all of that, you can, manage, you can do a good job of taking care of the body. But it's irresistibly, it's a flow. It's a flow. Jayate, being born, asti, comes into existence, uh, vardhate, grows and develops and matures, viparinamate, adulthood, uh, you know, it reaches a plateau of development, uh, jiriyate, it, it degen degenerates, old age, decay, nashyati, just, uh, is death. That's the nature of the body. Are you bound to the body? No. You're not bound to the body. In fact, in Mumbai, there is an ashram called Prempuri Ashram. I've never been there. I've heard about it. He was a monk in the 1940s, 50s or 60s somewhere. 
And there's an interesting story about him. I heard this um, a few years ago. The story is that this monk, he was a married man and after uh, some time he gave up the world and he became a monk. And he says that he was in the Himalayas at one time. Near a Himalayan village, he was sitting there, sort of morose and dejected. And an old lady who was collecting firewood nearby, she came upon him and said, My child, why so sad? Why are you unhappy? And he said, I want freedom, mukti. Amko mukti chai. I want, I want freedom, mukti. And the woman smiled and she said, Freedom? From what? What are you bound to? Where are you bound? Show me your bondage, I, I will free you. Uh, are you bound to the body? Uh, oh, no, she said, what are you bound to? Are you bound to your wife? And this monk, he said, no, she died. Are you bound to your children? No, they grew up and went away. Are you bound to your property? No, before becoming a monk, I sold it off all and uh, gave away the money. Then what are you bound to? This body, it will age and go away within a few years, guaranteed. <coughs> what are you bound to? By you, I mean the awareness, the consciousness. Are you bound to thoughts? Oh, bad thoughts keep coming in my mind. I'm trapped by my thoughts. Many people, they suffer from the mind. It's no accident that people, when they shoot themselves, they shoot themselves in the head. They want to make it stop. So, here is a message of hope. You are not bound to the mind either. The mind is a series of thoughts, like a beam of sunlight. You have motes of dust dancing around there. Similarly, in you, the awareness, the mind is a series of thoughts. Like the river Ganga, which is continuously flowing. And there are, um, you see a dead body flowing past. And if you jump in there and swim and catch hold of the body and then dead body and you say, Oh, how awful, it is such a stink and now I'm polluted and it's ugly and it's all messy. Why are you doing it? Why are you holding on to it? It's floating when the river, it will go away in its own way. A, a garland discarded, this is an example from a monk. A garland discarded from some temple upstream, it flows past. And you jump there, swim mightily and catch hold of it. Oh, now I'm pure and enlightened, I mean uh, uh, elevated and sublime because I've got something holy. Why are you doing that? All of that is flowing past on the river by its own current. You sit by the side of the river and watch it go by. Exactly like that, in the river of the mind, your mind, in the river of the mind, many thoughts, feelings, emotions, desires, they come and go, they stay for some time, they dance around in front of you. You are the witness consciousness, Sakshi, sitting on the bank. In your light, all this is lit up and revealed. You may go ahead and use some of them, but don't be attached to them. They are not you. And they will never stay there. Imagine, even the greatest depression, great sorrow, uh, great guilt, something is there which is torturing me. Then, even that one, every day in the night when I fall asleep, gone. And if I am honest, throughout the day when I am suffering, there will be moments when it disappears from my mind. Uh, it increases and it decreases. Um, so, throughout the day these thoughts come and go. Right? So what are you bound to? Not even the thoughts. Think about it this way. You, the consciousness right now, na baddhaha, they're not bound to anything at all. It's only by saying, I am this, this is mine, then we get bound. We get limited and bound. Na sadhaka, not even a spiritual practitioner. See, spiritual practice Spiritual practice. What is spiritual practice? Cause and effect. If I do this, I will get that result. And the technical terms are sadhya. The Sanskrit term is sadhya, the goal to be attained. Sadhana, the means employed. And sadhaka, the one who uses these means. So the example I give is, you want to come here to the Vedanta Society. This is your goal, sadhya. This is what you want to attain. And the means you use is the subway. That is the sadhana, the means. And you are the sadhaka, the practitioner, the one who uses those means to come here. So use those means, use the subway to come attain your goal that is coming to the Vedanta society. All spiritual practice is like that. I am using the Vedantic paradigm now. 
Look at the practices. My mind is impure. I need to purify my inner being. So karma yoga is prescribed. Unselfish action. Action as a worship of God. So I do the worship of God, uh, action as a worship of God. I do unselfish action and the result will be purification of the mind. I am a karma yogi. I want concentration of mind. I want to focus on God. Then there is Raja Yoga, meditation. I sit, uh, and I breathe like this, focus like this, you know, withdraw from the world. Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi. So my goal is focus of mind, concentration of mind. The method is meditation and I am the Raja Yogi, the meditator. Hmm? Or even Jnana Yoga, Vedanta. The goal is enlightenment and the obstacle is ignorance and for that I must generate knowledge to remove the ignorance and I, I study Vedanta, come to class. This is my sadhana, Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, listening to this, thinking about it, meditating upon it until I become enlightened. Sadhaka, sadhana. And Gaudapada says, Nacha sadhaka. There is nobody who is a sadhaka, nobody who is a spiritual practitioner. Why? Why not? See, from his point of view, if you look at the pure consciousness, Atman, the self, Shankaracharya uses four words. What can any kind of action accomplish? He says, Apya, Samskarya, Vikarya, uh, Utpadya, Apya, Samskarya, Vikarya. These are the four things which action can accomplish. Utpadya means produce. So work in the farm and then produce vegetables. It is production. Can you produce the ultimate reality? Lot of spiritual practice. I'm going to meditate a lot and repeat the mantra and do lots of rituals and, and then produce God. No, you cannot. It's an eternal reality. How can you produce it? It's always there. Then the second thing, apya, uh, can I attain? You know, like you want to attain the Vedanta society. You come by subway and come here. You have attained it. And to attain heaven, I do Vedic sacrifices to go to heaven after death. It is something separated from me by space. Something separated from me by time. And an other. Separation in space, time, object. By space, I mean, this is the earth, earth world, samsara, and that is, that is heaven, swarga, heaven. I can go there. So that is space separation. Is there such a separation in, in you, the self? Are you separated from yourself? No. You are you. Where else can you be except you? So you are there. You are your, yourself only. There is no separation in, in the self, in space. Is there separation in time? Um, now and then. Uh, after death. After time. After death. After the second coming of the Christ or after the next avatar comes or something like that. After. So you the pure awareness. Is it after something or now? Now. There is no separation. There is no question of apya. Getting it or attaining it. It is already there. You are that. Then the third one is uh, vikarya. Transformation. You transform milk into yogurt. So can I transform myself? A jiva into Brahman? No, that's also not true. Because you are that pure consciousness. What will that pure consciousness transform itself into? There's no transformation there. And the final one is samskarya. The building needs a coat of paint to give a coat of paint to it. Uh, oil extracted, petroleum products. You have to re go through a long process of refining it. A very complicated process which will give you the petroleum products. So can you, can you refine the jiva? Put the jiva into some kind of extraction machinery and extract pure consciousness from it. No. You are that pure consciousness. So none of the things which are products of work, of action, which means sadhana. None of them will give you what you already are. Then what, what is Vedanta? What does it do then? We have a saying, praptasya prapti nivrittasya nivritti. It gives you what you already have. And it removes what was never there. <laughs> you, the pure consciousness, it gives you that. You're all, you're all, you already are that. You just don't know it. And what does it remove? 
bondage, samsara, suffering was never there in pure consciousness. Yeah. That, so that which never was there is removed from you and what you always wear is given to you. You had a question. Yes. The third, uh, the third one is an indication of separateness. So, but the first three hmm. uh, presume that both consciousness and the object are, are realities. Are realities. Uh, whereas the fourth one, uh, there is only one reality. So one it's reality. It's clearly an indication of relationship. So yes. In the sense, I'm struggling to see how is there a relationship on the fourth. There the isn't. That's the important thing. There isn't a relationship. There cannot be a relationship between the rope and the snake. There cannot be any relationship between the rope and the snake. There cannot be any relationship between you and the cookie you ate at night. In, 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 not at night, in the dream. At night if you eat a cookie, there's a relationship. It will be in you. But if you eat a cookie in your dream, there's no relationship between you, the waker, and that cookie. Similarly, there's no relationship between consciousness as it is and all the universe experienced in consciousness because that universe is not an other. A relationship requires at least two terms. Between the real and the false, there can be no relationship. Shankaracharya puts it this way. All the water in the mirage is not enough to wet one grain of sand of the, uh, of the desert. All the water in the mirage, you know, an oasis, it appears in a mirage, is not enough to wet one grain of sand of the desert. Similarly, all of samsara, the greatest of tragedies, the most horrible of things, cannot do the least bit of harm to you, the pure consciousness, in which it all appears. It cannot harm you. It can harm the body, certainly. It can harm the society, certainly. But behind all of that is you, the reality. That can never be touched by this. Yes. Um, so, nacha sadhaka, uh, no, there is no practitioner as such because you are that and Advaita just tells you what you already are, always have been. Yes. So, I was just curious when you said, like Sri Ramana's teachings for example, or Nisargadatta Maharaj, yes. so they fall in line with Advaita. Absolutely, and, and the, they both fall in line with the radical kind of Advaita that Gaudapada is talking about, okay. he, this one, yes. Yes, they're, they're exactly the same thing, in fact. Um, then he's, yes. Me, um, uh, it's just my humble opinion, but most of the sorrow or sadness or whatever we suffer from seem, or, and the pleasure seems to be coming because of the body. Yes. So why does the consciousness why does the consciousness live in the body? Right. Very good question. Why does the consciousness live in the body? What would Gaudapada say? Doesn't. 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 <laughs> in fact, I will ask you one thing. Simple. Uh, I will make a simple statement. Look at your own experience and tell me. Is the body in consciousness or is consciousness in the body? What is your experience telling you right now? Not what you have read in a book. Are you aware of the body? That means the body is in your awareness. Or are you a body and somewhere inside you there is an awareness? No. Which one? No. The first one. Look at your experience right now. Very interesting. <coughs> Advaita does this much only. Our idea is I am a body with consciousness. In which there is consciousness. Advaita wants you to shift the perspective. Be honest. Look at your own experience and tell the truth. You, you are awareness experiencing a body in yourself. Okay. Yes. Uh, vikarya, samskarya, refinement. And we say shanshkar kara, refinement here. So can you refine? I am a sinful little jiva. Can I be polished and rubbed and scrubbed until I become a shiny Brahman? Um, pure consciousness? No need, no need at all. Okay. The next one is na mumukshuhu, no seeker, na muktaha. I'll move quickly now. Na mumukshuhu, there is no spiritual seeker at all. You understand, from the point of view of pure consciousness, who is a seeker of what? Um, Shankaracharya in his hymn, Manovuddhihanka, that said, Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham, 
one of the lines in third verse is na dharmo na chartho na kamo na moksha chidananda rupa shivoham shivoham what is my goal in life it is not dharma it is not artha it is not kama it is not moksha it's not pleasure it is not success in life it is not religion not doing good it is not even liberation how interesting he's a spiritual um, giant he's saying that even liberation is not my goal that's supposed to be our goal he says no why because i am pure consciousness i am shiva i am shiva from the point of view of pure consciousness what liberation what liberation is there so from that from the highest point of view okay na mukta so one interesting thing this whole idea of moksha <coughs> why freedom from what what is it that we want and we are struggling for we all want to live there's nobody who says that i don't want to be we all want to exist when we think we are a body we want the body to exist when you think we are not the body but this person we want the person to exist now this silicon valley people are saying let the body go we will upload ourselves into the cloud <laughs> we'll convert all our memories and everything into data and upload us so that person is already advanced is not thinking is the body anymore is thinking i'm information vedant will say go one step further <laughs> uh, so this in sanskrit is called the word is jijivisha desire to be in this limited form desire to exist and then one more thing we want to know jigyasa to know we want to know more and more see we more want to be aware somebody tells me you don't want to die no so if we keep you alive you know in life support in mount sinai yes yes somehow keep me alive but um, will you be satisfied if you're alive but you're completely unconscious no 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 i want to be alive and conscious i want to be alive and conscious so we want to be aware of our existence also our because our very nature is awareness basically that is called <coughs> and we want to know so in general you can use the word jigyasa the desire to know but basically desire to be aware and there's one more thing we want if somebody tells me yes you will live and you will be aware but all throughout you will be in terrible pain are you okay with that no 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 i want to be happy i want to enjoy i want to you know so this is in sanskrit called bubhuksha desire to enjoy i feel i'm incomplete i want those things to experience those things to have those things many things in the world then i will be complete and happy so these three things we want in sanskrit jijivisha desire to live jigyasa desire to know bhubuksha desire to enjoy or consume or enjoy or you know fulfill ourselves now what gaudapada is saying when you realize your real nature you will find you are pure being you can never die so you are freed from the desire to live in this particular body you find you are infinite awareness that awareness which is behind all knowledge and knowing so that particular desire that i i must be aware in this way that one also goes because you are awareness itself how can you not be aware and then finally i am ananda sat chit ananda i am complete i am blissful i am bliss itself as vivekananda put it not that it exists it is existence itself not that it knows it is knowledge itself not that it is happy it is happiness itself so that desire for bubuksha to consume to have more and more until i am complete that also is satisfied being freed from these three desire for limited existence you have found an unlimited life every religion promises that vedanta puts it in a very philosophical way you have found an unlimited awareness and you have found completeness purnatva wholeness beyond which nothing more can be desired hence you are set free from these imperatives to live and to know and to consume this is moksha um beautiful idea actually and then na mukta there is nobody who is liberated i always tell the story of how nisargadatta was somebody praised nisargadatta oh you are a brahma gyani you are a knower of brahman and he was a rough man a tough man so he scolded you are insulting me his scolding is also a teaching you are insulting me how is the knower of brahman how is it an insult i am not a knower of brahman i am brahman the very term a knower of brahman includes a little bit of ignorance there as if i am somebody who knows brahman 
That's why the Keno Upanishad says, the one who says, I know, does not know. <laughs> so you are not a person who is free, but you are free of the person. I like that uh, restatement, that you are free of the person. You are not a person who is free. You are freedom itself. So just as you are not a jnani, one who knows, you are jnana swarupa, the very essence of knowledge, which is consciousness. Similarly, you are not muktaha, one who is liberated, but moksha swarupa, one whose essential nature is always freedom. Your nature itself is freedom. Ittyesha paramarthata, this is the highest truth. Fundamental truth. We are running out of time. I wanted to read a little Shankaracharya. Let me just make this statement. So what is Gaudapada's idea about this universe? The fundamental truth is, it's only awareness. It's only consciousness. How do you do that? Five steps. This Gaudapada has not said. But this I heard from a great scholar, so I'll repeat it to you. Look at it this way. How Vedanta looks at this universe. This entire universe, physical universe, is nothing but... Uh, sky and uh, wind and uh, fire and water and earth, the primordial elements. Today in the modern science you might put in different way, periodic table. But the five elements. So everything in this universe, including our bodies and also our minds, are reduced to five elements. So everything in this universe is five elements. Step one. Here itself, almost all the problems are solved. <laughs> These elements do not die. So we are, uh, there, there is no death, there is no suffering, there is no want, no hunger, no, no problem, no hatred, no prejudice. How can there be prejudice? Everybody is that same five elements, nothing else. Literally, physically. You don't have to go to spirituality also. Materialism itself solves all your problems that way. So it's all just five elements, the play of five elements. This itself is a big, big truth worth thinking about. It cannot be disputed. You, don't, you may not think about it in terms of five elements. Think about it in terms of the elements of physics or chemistry. That's all what we are. Then Vedanta says, take a step back, deeper. All these five elements are what? They are, Maya itself is projected as these five elements. Brahman is projected by Maya as these five elements. Maya appears as the five elements. Or in Vedantic terms, Maya is the Parinami Karana of the five elements. So these five elements are nothing but, all the elements are nothing but Maya. Step two. Step three, I'm going very fast. <coughs> Step three, what is Maya then? Maya is, it rests on Brahman. It has no independent existence apart from Brahman. The relationship between Maya and Brahman is Adhar Adhe or Shakti and Shaktiman. So Adhar Adhe means supporter and supported. The ground, Maya's ground of existence is Brahman. Brahman is isness and Maya is the power of that isness. So they exist in the relationship of Adhara Adhaya. Step three. Supporter and supported. Maya basically meaning that Maya is not an independent power. Notice here. Prakriti is an independent power in Sankhya. Purusha Prakriti. This Prakriti itself becomes Maya in Vedanta. So Maya is not an independent power. Maya rests in Brahman. Now, step four, the question is asked, how does Maya rest in Brahman? Um, are they two separate things? Like this hand is the support and the pen is supported by the hand like this? He says, no, 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 not like that. Maya is pervaded through and through by Brahman. Vyapya Vyapaka, pervader and pervaded. Every bit of Maya is pervaded by Brahman. Step four. When I say Maya, I mean the world itself. Five elements are nothing but Maya. Maya is supported by Brahman. And Brahman pervades, Maya means Brahman pervades this entire universe. So the entire universe is pervaded by Brahman. Now the question is asked, how does Brahman pervade this universe? If I switch on a light, it pervades the room. But light is not the room. You switch on the light, the whole room is flooded by light. But light is not the room. If I light an incense, the incense will the fragrance will pervade the room. But the incense is not the room. Room is a separate space and incense is something that spreads around. Is it like that? Brahman is something that spreads around the universe, is sort of somewhere like incense or like light? No. Brahman is like um, 
suppose I say um, the clay part or water and the wave, the water alone appears as the wave. Every bit of the wave is water. Every bit of the ornament is gold. Every bit of the pot is clay. In the same way, every bit of the universe pervaded by Brahman means it is nothing but Brahman. So the universe is nothing but Brahman. That's the last one. In, in the Sanskrit, Chin Matra, pure consciousness. So five steps. Think about these five steps. Question is, what is the five steps to what? From universe to Brahman. From universe to the ultimate. Let's use consciousness. Let's use the word consciousness. From universe to pure consciousness. How? Step one. The universe is just the five elements. Still very physical. Five elements. Step two. Deeper. Back. More fundamental. The five elements are nothing but Maya. So the universe is nothing but Maya. In Hindi, in India, common people also, <laughs> villages, sub Maya hai. <laughs> all is Maya. <laughs> this, this, they don't understand all the philosophy, they just say it. But this is what it means. All the universe is nothing but Maya. But what is Maya? It is supported in or it is nothing apart from Brahman. So this universe rests in Brahman. The Brahman is the ground of this universe. It's in fact the very language used by Meister Eckhart, the great German mystic in the medieval ages. Ground of all reality is God. So Brahman is the ground of Maya, therefore Brahman is the ground of this universe. The universe rests in, in, in Brahman. How does the universe rest in Brahman? Like the pen on the hand? No. Universe is pervaded by Brahman. Stage 4. Brahman pervades this universe. How does Brahman pervade the universe? Like incense in a room or light in a room? No. Like gold in ornament, like water in the wave. Uh, every bit of the wave is water. Every bit of the ornament is gold. The wave has no existence apart from water. The ornament has no existence apart from gold. Similarly, the universe, every bit of it is pure consciousness. And it has no existence apart from pure consciousness. It is pure consciousness alone. Chin matram. Awareness alone, consciousness alone. Though it looks separate out there. Alright. This is called by Gaudapada the highest truth, Paramarthata. Now, in the time remaining, let me quickly read out 1500 years ago what Shankaracharya commented. I will read the original Sanskrit and give you the running translation in English. It's very fascinating. I have given you a general explanation. But how does the master of non-duality, Shankaracharya, explain this verse? If you just hear this, you will get an idea what he is doing. Okay. I'll read the Sanskrit more for my benefit so that I can translate easily. He introduces the verse. Prakaranartho Pasangharartho Ayam Shlokaha. To conclude, to bring to us to a climax the teachings of this chapter, here is this verse. So see how much importance he gives to this verse. Yada vitatham dvaitam atmaivekaha paramarthataha san. When the enlightened one, I'm using, he doesn't say enlightened one. When one sees the dualistic universe as false, as an appearance. And the self, you the awareness, as the one ultimate reality, paramarthata san. When you see that, then tada idam nishpannam bhavati. Then this becomes very clear. What becomes clear? Sarvoyam laukiko vaidikascha vyavahara avidya vishaya evaiti. All the activities that go on in the world, worldly activities and he says vaidika means religious activities, they are all products of ignorance. Not knowing what we are, we engage in worldly and even religious activities. Religious activities might mean like trying to go to heaven and things like that. We do not know what we are and what this world is. So they are all products of ignorance. Tada. Therefore, then the verse is there. Na nirodho na chotpatti na baddho na cha sadhaka na mu mukshur na vai mukta ityesha paramarthata. The verse is there. Then Shankaracharya explains word by word. Very quickly, what does he do? 
na nirodha, nirodhanam nirodha pralayah. There is no end or cessation of what? This universe. Utpatti jananam, there is no creation. Origination means creation. Of what? This universe. Baddha samsari jivaha. There is nobody who is bound. Who, what do you mean by bound? Samsari jiva. Like us, we, we feel that we are an individual being trapped in samsara. He says, no, it's not there. Sadhaka. What is the meaning of sadhaka? Sadhana van mokshasya. Uh, sadhaka means spiritual practitioner. What kind of practitioner? Because in India, even say somebody is learning classical music. That's also called sadhana, kind of practice. So he says, Mokshasya sadhana one, the one who is engaged in spiritual practices for liberation. Such a person, not there. Mumukshur, Mochanarthi, seeker of liberation. Mumukshu means one who, is, who wants liberation. Mukta, Vimukta Bandhaha, liberated means one who is freed from bondage. So he quickly gives a word by word translation. Then he says, Utpatti pralayayor abhavad. Baddhadayo na santi ittesha paramarthata. This is the highest truth that since there is no cessation, there is no origination or cessation, cessation of this universe, the rest of it, somebody in bondage, somebody spiritual, doing spiritual practice, somebody getting liberated, the question does not arise at all. If the universe itself is not there, it's not real, then all the things happening in the universe, they are all appearances, they are not real separately. <coughs> Then how do you know this? So he gives a series of quotations from the Upanishads to prove that Gaudapada is not saying something very radical and new. He is basically teaching what the Upanishads are teaching. But in a very harsh language, let's say, uncompromising language. Then he gives some quotations. I am skipping the quotations. Then he comes to an interesting discussion. I will read out the Sanskrit and... The translation. I think you can catch. If you do not catch, uh, uh, tell me. The discussion goes like this. The question is, what is this universe then? It doesn't exist, but we experience. So what is it that we are experiencing? What's the nature of the thing we are experiencing right now? Sato hi utpatti pralayo va syat na sata sasha vishana dehe. Cessation and origination. Origination and cessation cannot be of the absolutely unreal like the horn of a rabbit. That was the classic example for non-existent things. Rabbits don't have horns. Today you might see a square circle. A square circle. Something impossible. Square circle. Can neither originate nor cease. So cessation and origination cannot be of completely unreal things. Okay, one. Napi advaita mutpadyate liyateva. But the non-dual reality, advaita, Pure consciousness. That cannot be produced, that cannot cease also. Non-dual reality, how can it be? what will produce it? There is no other second thing. Where will it cease? There is no other, nothing else apart from it. That pure consciousness is eternal. So it can neither be generated nor... So non-dual reality cannot be produced or destroyed. Advayam chautpatti pralaya vacheti vipratti shiddham Non-dual reality is produced and destroyed is a contradictory statement. That it is non-dual and yet it is produced and destroyed. Viprati Shiddham, contradictory statement. Then what is it that we see? It's not the non-dual reality. It's, so this is not the non-dual reality. It's not also absolutely unreal because we are seeing it. So what is it? He says, you know, he will give the example of the rope snake. What you are seeing is an appearance. It's not absolutely unreal like a rabbit's horn, square circle, but it's not absolutely real also like pure consciousness. It's an appearance in pure consciousness. He'll say that now. Yastu punar dvaita sang vyavaharaha sa rajju sarpavad atmani pranadi lakshana kalpita ityuktam. So, as far as this, uh, the world of duality is concerned, the transactional world of duality, the one in which we, which we are experiencing right now. What is the status of this? He says it's like a rope snake. Um, just as a rope, uh, as a snake is, erron a rope is erroneously mistaken as a snake, snake appears erroneously in a rope. Similarly, the entire universe, he says, prana di lakshana, starting from prana, etc. What does he mean by that? 
few verses ago, he gave a list of 35 theories. First one was, God is the source of the universe. So he's literally, if you translate, from God downwards, everything else, all those things which all those theoreticians have described, they are all appearances in you, the pure consciousness. The reality is you, the world you experience is an appearance in you. Then he says, Nahi mano vikalpanaya, he talks about the example. Nahi mano vikalpanaya, Rajju sarpa dilakshanaya, Rajjuam pralaya utpattirva. The snake which is your error, projection of your mind, was never born in the rope, nor does it die there. You will say, no, it was in my mind. It's not even in your mind. Was there a real snake in your mind? God forbid. He comes next. Nacha manasi, Rajju sarpa utpatti pralayova. Not even in your mind. Neither is there a real snake out there on the rope, nor is there a real snake in your mind actually. And not the joint production of your mind and the rope also. Real snake nowhere exists. It's an appearance. Tatha, in that way. Manasattva visheshat dvaitasya. In the same way, the duality also appears. Um, here he says mind. Remember, uh, it might be slightly confusing. He says the entire world, universe appears in your mind. But the distinction must be made. The world of dreams is dreamt up by your mind. But this universe, including your mind, is projected in you, the consciousness. You are not dreaming up individually this world. Because Shankaracharya does not make that clear here. It might lead to... If you say this universe is an imagination of my mind, just like my dream universe is an imagination of my mind. If you say that, that is called subjective idealism in philosophy. And there is a school of Buddhists, Vijnanavadi, who say that. Advaita doesn't say that. But he says the mind plays a vital role. Notice that this universe appears to you only when your mind is active. Nahi niyate manasi sushupte va dvaitam grihyate. When your mind is in samadhi, niyate manasi means the mind is arrested in samadhi, or when you fall asleep, the world of duality does not appear to you. Ataha, therefore, what do we conclude? Mano vikalpana matram dvaitam iti siddham. This world of duality is an imagination of the mind. So be careful here. Uh, it does not mean the Vijnana or subjective idealism. The world of your dreams is definitely an imagination of your mind. And this world of the waking is a projection, is a projection of Maya, including your mind and body and everything else. Tasmat suktam dvaitasya sattva nirodhad nirodhadya bhava paramarthata iti. Therefore, it is well said. By whom? By Gaudapada. That um, because duality does not exist, therefore origination and cessation are not there. This is the highest truth. Now, here starts the real beauty of the commentary. Now, the Shunyavadi Buddhist, the Buddhist who is a proponent of the system of void, emptiness, he comes forward with a question. And the question is very interesting. If you look at the original verse of Gaudapada, no origination, no destruction, no seeker, no spiritual practitioner, nobody in bondage, nobody liberated, and this is the final truth. Nowhere does he mention Brahman is the final truth. He doesn't even mention pure consciousness is the final truth. <coughs> so the Shunyavadi says, then isn't emptiness the final truth? Because you have denied all duality. You have not established non-duality. So the result is emptiness. Shunyam, nothing. So there is no final truth at all. All that we see to be the truth, Gaudapada denied. And the so-called non-dual truth you are talking about, he has not mentioned it here. So emptiness is the truth. Nothingness is the truth. Shunyam. Yadi evam dvaita, this is a question. Question is being asked. Yadi evam dvaita bhave shastra vyaparo na dvaite virodhat tathacha satya Pramana, Pramana Bhavat, Shunyavada Prasangaha, Dvaitasya Chabhavat. 
he says your text denies duality and negates duality and does not point out non duality and therefore not having established non duality having negated duality the result is emptiness void nothing there is no truth it's empty so what do you say to that shankaracharya answers here na no so this is very very close to the english no na in sanskrit means no no that is not so why not rajju sarpadi vikalpanaya niraspadatvat niraspadatva anupapatti hiti pratyuktam ittetat katham ujjivayasi ityaha okay ujjivayasi yes no falsity always requires a grounding in truth the false rope necessary a false snake necessarily implies a real rope a snake doesn't just appear in the air just like that something is mistaken for the snake so when you realize that the snake when the snake is denied automatically what you are affirming is the rope so when you deny the object you are affirming the consciousness to which the object is aff- uh, appearing all objective reality is denied so the reality belongs to the consciousness in which the object is appearing you he won't let go he's just beginning the opponent he says aha uh-huh. i would like to say here i would like to say actually i left out a little bit iti pratyuktam katham ujjivayasi shankaracharya says a little testily here i have already explained this long ago why are you resurrecting a, a, a dead question <laughs> uh, actually in the first chapter this question had come and uh, shankaracharya had um, answered given this answer if you use the rope snake example note that the snake is false immediately meaning that the rope is real similarly duality false on the ground of a real non duality so why are you again resurrecting this question and the buddhist replies cuz i can get lost in this so i don't want you to we still have a little bit of time can i take a few minutes more uh, if you want to go yeah those who want to leave i know you have trains to catch and things like that you know so i mean, now the discussion is going to get hot so <laughs> if you lose track of this next time it won't make sense why are you asking this again the buddhist says because i have some follow up questions <laughs> so he says rajjurapi sarpa vikalpasya aspada bhuta vikalpam vikalpa iti eve iti drishtant anupapatti he says your example is not right why because when you say snake is false rope is real but the rope itself is also false according to your advaita vedanta philosophy Uh, so a falsity is based upon another falsity and so all the way down then it can be all false what he means here is in advaita vedanta brahman alone is real everything including rope the humble rope is not spared so the entire if the entire universe you have been working so hard to show in the whole chapter the entire universe has no origination no cessation what to speak of a rope a little rope that is also false so <laughs> the rope is also false if you extend that argument it turns out that everything in the universe is false one falsity may be based on another falsity as you said what does he say we know na no vikal vikalpana vikalpana kshaye avikalpitasya avikalpitatvad eva sattva pavatte he what does he mean here is note something in the example the full example is there is a rope but we don't know few friends are going in the darkness they see the rope one says oh look it's a snake the other one says no it's a garland discarded from the temple the third one says no it's a crack on the earth rajju or, or it's, a, it's a trickle of water rajju dhara mala uh, not rajju sarpa dhara mala in sanskrit a, a serpent another one sees it as a discarded garland another one sees it as a trickle of water there now they go with a torch maybe like a flame or something and they see and what do they see shankaracharya points out here all three disappear 
the snake disappears, the rope, dis the trickle of water disappears and the garland disappears, but not the rope. So when the ground of error is revealed, the varieties of errors are dispelled, leaving the ground untouched. The rope did not disappear when the other three were cancelled. There is something which is misunderstood as a snake or a garland or a trickle of water. The misconceptions are cleared up when the underlying rope is revealed. And the knowledge which reveals the rope makes those three disappear but does not make the rope disappear. So therefore the rope is not projected at that level. Yes, from the perspective of Brahman it's false. Right? So we talk about levels of truth. That's what he's trying to say. He won't let go. The, uh, the uh, <laughs> Shunyavadi. Rajju Sarpavada Sattva Miti Chet. He says, No, but it could be that just like the um, rope is also ultimately false, the ultimate reality is also false. What, what you said was, you cancelled the snake by realizing it's a rope. You could cancel the rope by realizing it's Brahman. But you can cancel Brahman also by realizing something else. So this, there is no end to this. Uh, so it could all be a structure of falsity. There is no reality at all. It could be. Just why not? Why, why can't you? I am reminded of um, a story that Bertrand Russell tells about the, the cosmos. He is giving a lecture on cosmology. You know the old myth that there is a tortoise and on that uh, uh, elephant and ele on the elephant there is an, uh, the earth is supported on that. So he tells this story that in early 20th century he was giving a talk. And this little old lady, English lady, she, she stands up and says that, You're a very clever young man, but we know it's a tortoise. <laughs> that the earth is supported in a tortoise. It's not hang, it doesn't hang in space. It is, it, that's clearly illogical. Obviously there's a tortoise below, below it on which the earth is... So Bertrand Russell said, you know, he thought he was being clever when he asked the lady, but ma'am, on what is the tortoise standing? And she said, don't be, she said, don't be impertinent with me, young man. It, everybody knows it's tortoises all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> so an infinite column of tortoises. So why not one falsity cancelled by another one and cancelled by another one and so on and so forth. So all of it could be false. He says, no. Na ekantena avikalpita tvat avikalpita rajju angshavat prak sarpa bhava vijnanat. He says, no. Why not? He says that there is a truth which is always experienced even before you become enlightened. What he means by this is a subtle point he is pointing out. When you say, this is a snake, error. But Shankaracharya says, wait a minute, it's not an error. There is truth and error mixed in all errors. How? When you say, this is a snake, the this is part is true. The next moment when you will say, this is a rope, you have replaced a snake with a rope, the this is continues. What you saw as this, you still see as this. Earlier it was a snake, now it is a rope. So, in the same way, every experience that you have, I am a body. Body is an appearance, but the I am part is true. Ultimately, I am pure consciousness. That will be the truth. So, in every experience, the truth is there. And it provides a foundation to the error. Falsity cannot exist by itself. Nothing is completely false. Every false experience has an underlying truth. In fact, even you take rope snake example, snake, this is a snake. Corrected, this is a rope. Corrected, this is Brahman. But this is continues. Because Brahman is isness. So the truth is always experienced, never negated. And that is the truth we are pointing towards. In fact, the non-dualist will say, you are experiencing Brahman even now. In dreams, you are experiencing that pure consciousness. In waking, you are experiencing that pure consciousness. Enlightenment is just recognizing it for what it is. That sets you free.
It's going to get even more interesting. And he goes on further to say, Vikalpai Tushcha Prag Vikalpa Prag Vikalpana Utpattehe Siddhattva Bhyupagamat Asattva Anupapattehe And before something is projected, the projector must be admitted. So before the error is made, the one in whose awareness that the error is being made must be admitted. In the same way before Maya projects this universe, to whom and in whom does Maya project? So you must admit a ground of reality. So now the, um, we'll take up this final question. This still goes on, but this is very interesting. Now the questionnaire, the Shunyavadi, he changes track, makes the question more subtle. Katam puna swarupe vyapara bhave shastrasya dvaita vijnana nivartakatvam. He says, all right, granted that there is this non-dual reality, what you are saying, granted. But how do you know? Because you are saying this uh, teaching, the Shastra, the Advaita teaching, the Upanishads, Gaudapada, they remove the ignorance. They remove the ignorance and reveal the truth. How do they re uh, remove the ignorance? How do, you remove, how do you correct the error that this is a snake? What is the exact process? By revealing the Adhishthana, the ground, the reality. The error is corrected only by revealing the reality. You have to take a torch and take a look and take a um, flame or a lantern or something and take a look. Reveal the rope. The error that it is a snake is automatically corrected. Right? I said yes. So two things are necessary. The error that it is not a snake and that it is a rope both have to be revealed. And you do that by revealing that it is a rope. But in this case, it's impossible because don't you yourself say, you non-dualists, that Brahman, the non-dual reality, cannot be revealed by words. You cannot reveal the underlying truth by Upanishad or by this. You cannot reveal it. If you cannot reveal the underlying truth, you cannot can cancel the duality also. If you could never show the rope, how would you be sure that it's not a snake? And here in, this case, in that case you can show that it's a rope by shining light upon it. But here you cannot reveal non-dual Brahman. Because no, you yourself say, words cannot do it. Your Upanishad, your Gaudapada, none of them can reveal the non-dual Brahman to you. Then how will you cancel, you say this verse is cancelling all duality. How will you cancel duality if you cannot show the non-duality? You see, what is the question? The answer is very illuminating. It leads straight to the heart of the problem. If you can get it, it's really helpful. That's why I want to read that out and stop. Okay. Naisha doshaha. There is no fault here. Surprise. <laughs> what, what is the solution? Rajvam sarpadi vad atmani dvaitasya atmani dvaitasya avidya dhyastatvat. He says, just as a snake is superimposed on the rope. That means you mistake the rope for a snake. In the same way, due to ignorance of the self, not an ignorance of a rope or something else. It's not Brahman out there. It is because of not knowing what you are that you imagine this external, this whole error of samsara is coming. So, how does that solve the question? See, it says, Katham, how, how does it help? Then he goes on. It's a long sentence. I'll read it out. Sukhi aham dukhi mudho jato mrito jirno dehavan pashyami vyakto abhyakta katta phali sangyukta vyukta kshino vridho aham mama aham mama ete ityeva madaya sarvam atmani adhyaropyante atma ete shvanugataha sarvatra abhyabhicharat Yatha sarpadharadi bhedeshu rajyuhu. He says, in all our experiences, remember the snake example. This is a snake. There were two parts to it. One is false, one is real. One is, what is the false part? Snake. What is the real part? This is. This is. Ultimately, you will come to this is a rope. But this is, is the real part. In the same way, he says, consider all our experiences. There are two parts to the, each experience. The reality is there. And there is an unreal, there is a mistake involved. What are our experiences? He gives a long list. Sukhi aham, I am happy. False part of it, happy. 
real part of it i am <laughs> dukhi aham i am sad false part sad <laughs> why anitya remember the same logic it comes and goes two two reasons godapad has given is work the whole chapter to give those two reasons you have to keep it in mind it comes and goes number 1 and number 2 it is revealed by consciousness it's an object to consciousness but i am does not come and go we will see now it's there always and it is not revealed by consciousness it is consciousness mood ho i am confused this is our our, our state <laughs> more confused after the class but the the good news is confused false part i the consciousness which sees the confusion is the truth jato mrito i am born i am dead or i will die false i am the one common that is true jirno i am old and sick i am correct old and sick appearance dehavan i have a body i am a body i am one with a body with a body false i am true pashyami i see i hear i smell i taste i touch that i part is true all the others come and go they are appearances in your consciousness vyaktaha i am well known uh, my fame spreads around abhyaktaha I, i diminish i am nothing i am forgotten i am is the correct one the rest is karta phali i am the doer of actions i am the enjoyer of the results of actions doer enjoyer appearances false i am is the truth sanyukta vyukta i am one with others vyukta i am separated from others you know married separated divorced i am this one thing kshinaha i am much reduced physically financially whatever you call it i am vriddaha i am old i am aham mameti i am this these are mine i am is the truth this and these are appearances in consciousness iti eva madaya sarva atmani adhya rupyante in etc he says all experiences in life are appearances in you the self in consciousness again so what are you trying to say atma eteshu anugata sarvatra abhya vicharat the atman you are you run through all of these experiences unchangeably you are there in all of these experiences these experiences come and go these experiences are false because they come and go and they are objects of consciousness you are one constant example yatha sarpa dharaadi bhedeshu rajjuhu as when somebody sees a snake when somebody sees a trickle of water when somebody sees a garland in all three of them constant is the rope though it seems invisible constant in all your life is you the awareness everything else is an appearance and disappearance in you the awareness you the awareness is free of pleasure and pain birth and death old age and misery and you the awareness because you are that what shankaracharya will go on to say you are continuously self revealed the upanishad doesn't have to reveal you the self consciousness is revealed see the snake has to be revealed by a light but the atman is swaprakasha self revealed consciousness what do you need con- to reveal this light what other light do you need no other light the light reveals everything and itself if this is true for a material light imagine for uh, consciousness consciousness reveals the entire world and reveals itself in the process you don't need the upanishad to reveal consciousness all you need the upanishad is to remove the the error that this consciousness is limited and suffering and small uh, because it gets tied up with all the appearances that's what shankaracharya will like argue yeah. let's stop here it goes on like this Om Shanti 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 Hari Hi Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanam Astur